This morning we're going to uh, look at a passage in the Bible that's probably one of the most important, I think, in the whole scripture. And the reason for that is, is it's a place where Jesus clearly, not through parable, not through any other illustration, but just very clearly says what it takes to be saved. And he's, he's talking to a rich young ruler. Now, not the rich young ruler we normally think of, but the rich young ruler Nicodemus. He was rich, he was young, and he was a Pharisee. And he'd been impressed by the fact that Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple. It had, it had bothered him that the poor people were being taken advantage of and that there was commerce going on in church. And when the Jews, of course, the ones who were run out, they were angry. They immediately wanted to do whatever they could to stop Christ. And his voice said, be careful what you're doing because you may be working against God. And so they, they didn't go on with their plans. They did that much later. But he wanted to talk to Jesus. But he found it a little difficult to do it in public because, well, it would be a bit embarrassing. Uh, he, was, he didn't want to take the hassle that he would have if he was seen talking with Jesus. And so he knew where Jesus was at night in the evening and he left Jerusalem and went to where Jesus was. And the first thing he did and beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And that's an interesting thing. The first thing he was trying to do, of course, um, it's what salesmen do. They try to butter you up before they hit you with the stuff. Um, and, and he was trying to be complimentary, but with, without him probably even realizing it, he indicated his lack of faith. Because he didn't call Jesus the Son of God. He called him a teacher. And he was just trying to, you know, get conversation going and, and make Jesus feel good about himself. And Jesus completely ignored, completely ignored what Nicodemus said. He answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That one text, that one text, Jesus describes what it takes to be saved. And it's, it's rather clear. Now, Nicodemus, he kind of knew what Jesus meant. Because the Jews, when they converted somebody to Judaism, they considered them children. They called them children. What he couldn't deal with is the fact that somebody who was born the son of Abraham had to be born again, had to start out as a child again. That, that hit his spiritual pride. And it's interesting to note, the other rich young ruler that Jesus ran into, what did he talk to him about? He talked to him about money. He said, you have to give up all your money. And the reason is that that rich young ruler, his self-image, his goals, his objectives, everything that was important to him in life was tied up in his wealth. With Nicodemus, it was tied up in his spiritual pride, the fact that he was a son of Abraham. And uh, he kept the Sabbath faithfully, and he paid his tithe, and he did all the right stuff, and he couldn't see how when he did all the right things, he still needed to be born again. And so Nicodemus said to him, he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Now, that, that's a diversionary tactic, isn't it? In other words, there's a question, you know what the answer is, but you'd like to avoid it, and so you have a diversionary tactic. Unfortunately, your parents even use that with their children. Instead of dealing with issues when they come up, they try to divert their attention so that they can deal with that issue much later when it's much harder to deal with. Uh, and, and so it's, it's an area that uh, 
Nicodemus was, he was trying to divert the conversation, to change it. He didn't like the way it was going. And then Jesus answered to him and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, it's, it's quite clear that what Jesus is talking about there is that when we change direction, when we decide that instead of being concerned about our own life, our own interests, and we, God becomes first in our life, at that point, uh, we tell the world. And how do we tell the world? Through baptism. And that's what the water is. Through baptism, we tell the world, we've changed direction. We've turned around. Our thought processes are going to be different from now on. And the Spirit, he cannot be born, enter into the kingdom of God. And verse 6 says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And there again, that's a very, very profound statement. He's saying, look, naturally, you're concerned about yourself. You want to run your own life. You want to make your own decisions. You want to make your own choices. You don't want God messing with you. And do we see that in children? We do. They, they don't particularly like adults telling them what to do. They don't like anybody telling them what to do much. Um, and that's how we are with God. We're children. We're a little bit rebellious, and that's how we're born. And what changes that is the spirit. We don't change it. Unfortunately, almost every religion in the world takes the position that you have to earn God's favor, and you have to do good stuff so he'll accept you. And that is just exactly the opposite of what God wants us to believe. Because what does the Bible say? You're saved by faith. And if you stop and think about faith in its simplest terms, faith means that we accept the fact that God is sovereign, that he's the creator and we're the creature, that he's smarter than we are, and when he says something, he's right. No question. We don't question whether he's right or wrong because we know that God is right. That's faith. We believe that by faith. The next thing we believe by faith is that we are the most important thing in his universe to him. And that applies to everybody. Uh, Ellen White says that everyone is in his heart like they were the only one in the world. Now that's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? But when we stop and think about it, God's love for us is so dramatic and he wanted us to know what it was so bad that he was willing to die on a cross to prove how much he loved us. Jesus didn't die there because God was angry and says, boy, somebody's got to die. He died there to prove that God loved us so much he was willing to give up everything to save us. And that's what faith believes. Faith accepts that, that God loves us very much. And the third part of faith is that because we understand he knows more than we do, because we understand he's willing to die for us, then we want to be like him. And that, that's such an important thing because when God created Adam and Eve, when God created man, we were created in his image. And his creation, the beautiful, wonderful creation that he wanted, men in his image, men and women in his image, and no sin, no death, no, I mean, a perfect world, and it got messed up. And it got messed up quite simply by Eve being tempted and deciding, I think what I want is just as important as what God wants. I think... I know what he said, but I would like this, and so I think what I want is just as important as what he said. And that's been the basis of sin ever since. I mean, it always boils down to that. We know what God wants us to be. We know what he wants us to do. But there are just a few things we don't want to give to him. We like them. We want to hang on to them. And that makes it, of course, very difficult for the Spirit to work on our hearts. But the born again, the born again, the spirit works on our hearts until we make a choice. I'm going in a new direction. 
God is going to be the focus of my life. He's going to be the most important thing to me. And the, the wonderful thing to me about the, the concept of he knows more, he loves me, and I want to be like him is whatever happens in my life. It doesn't matter if it's a tragedy. It doesn't matter whatever happens. I can trust that he's in charge and he knows what he's doing. I can trust that he loves me more than anything else. And the only question I ask is in this hard time, how do I act like you? How do I reflect your character? Instead of saying, God, why did you make me go through this? That, that's kind of a selfish attitude. When we say, what did I do? Why did I have to do this? Um, it's sort of like when you ask your kids to clean their room. You know, why do I have to do that? I'll just mess it up again. Uh, and, and so people get angry with God. Well, when we're born again, we don't get angry with God. We say, God, how do I reflect you under these circumstances? Because that's the goal of our life, is to tell the truth about him. Now, the one thing we have to remember is when we're going in a direction and we discover that we're going the wrong way and we turn around, what's our location? It's exactly the same as it was, isn't it? We're just facing in a different direction. And so God doesn't expect us when we turn around, he doesn't expect us at that point to be at the end of the journey. That's where the Spirit begins to change our life, to make us new people, and to change those attitudes. Um, Ellen White says that imperceptibly to ourselves, we are changed day by day into his image. We don't even realize that it's going on, that it's happening. And that's what living by the Spirit means. And we can't live by the Spirit if we're still hanging on to that selfishness that says, I want my own way. I want it to do things my way. I want to be the one who decides what's right and wrong for me. And unfortunately, in our society right now, that has become the mantra. You're responsible. You, sh you should satisfy yourself. Take care of yourself first. Uh, you deserve a trophy. You deserve a lot of applause. You're a wonderful person. Uh, well, we shouldn't browbeat people and we shouldn't tell them they're worthless. We should never judge in that rate, but we should never ourselves feel that we're so special that we're spe more special than somebody else. Because we aren't, are we? Uh, I can remember as a little kid, because little kids, by nature, think of themselves as better than they ought. I mean, that's just kind of how we're born. And uh, I can remember my dad say, hey, you're getting too big for your britches, <laughs> you know? Well, I knew that I probably better alter my attitude or my britches would have something else happening. <laughs> and, uh, and so you learn. You learn as you grow. You learn to be less self-focused. Uh, I've always liked the saying that when scientists finally found this, find the center of the universe, there are going to be a lot of disappointed people. And we should never put ourselves in that position where we feel that we're the most important one around. And if, if, if you want confirmation of that, just go to Philippians 2. And that's where it talks about, let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. And that mind is that we consider others better than ourselves. Jesus' death on the cross indicate that he considered us more important than he considered himself. Well, if he could do that, why would we think we have any right to think of ourselves as better than we ought? Now, that doesn't mean we go around moping and saying, oh, I'm a terrible person and I'm awful. That's pretty selfish and self-focused, too. It means that, as Philippians 2.4 says, that we consider other people as well as ourselves. And that's true in everything we do in life, isn't it? When we go in, when we do business with somebody, we should stop and think that they have to make a profit, they have to live. We should not try to beat them down to the point where we're the only one who benefits from the transaction. We shouldn't do that, because that isn't taking other people's interest ahead of our own. And so as God begins working on us, his spirit works on us, and he describes it, he says it's like the wind. You know, the wind blows where it wants to, and we don't know where it came from, and we don't know where it went. But what does wind do? 
it changes things, doesn't it? You get a big wind and it changes a lot of things very quickly. And God's Spirit works like the wind. Sometimes he's a breeze, sometimes he's a bit of a gale, and sometimes he's a tornado. That's what wind is. And God works with people in different ways. But when we see somebody who's turned around, they've changed direction, they've been born again, they're babies. And we should not expect them to be adults. We should not expect them to have ac accomplished everything that maybe we have. And unfortunately, when we're critical of people, it usually has to do with they do something that we've overcome. But if we are willing to analyze ourselves honestly, we have things to overcome that are probably just as bad. The, and Jesus made clear that when we put him first, one thing we're going to do is become commandment keepers. Well, people think, okay, well, if I'm going to love Jesus, I have to keep his commandments. That's not what he says at all. He said, if you love me, I will make you commandment keepers. And why does he want us to be commandment keepers? Because that's the definition of love. The Ten Commandments are the definition of love. If you go down through there, it tells how we love God and how we love our fellow men. And God says, that's the character I want you to have, that you love me more, more than anything else, and you love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes so far in the Sermon on the Mount to say, look, you can break the Ten Commandments in your mind. It's not necessarily an action, but if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And all of a sudden, what he's telling us, if you love me, then you will love others. And you will love me with all your heart. And that's the spirit, that the spirit does that, is it works in our heart. It makes that happen. And you can't do it. There's nothing you can do on your part except to choose. Because a leopard can't change its spots, neither can an Ethiopian change his skin. I mean... We, can, we have no power to create ourselves or to recreate ourselves. Only God can do that. The power we have is allowing him to. We need to let him do what he wants to do. And if we do that, we will just find that our, what we like changes, the movies we want to watch change, the things we eat change, the things we drink change. Because he says, everything you do, whether you eat, or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's what we're supposed to do, is glorify God in everything that we do. Now, are we good at that? No, we're terrible. But what we do is we continue to go back to him in faith, asking for his spirit in our life, and when his spirit speaks, we move. And when, when we read something, when we see something, when we hear something that indicates God's will for our life, we don't respond to it like, oh no, I don't want to do that. It's, oh, that'll make me more like Jesus. That's what I want to do. And <clears throat> that's, that's the new birth. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, this is what it takes to be saved. It takes that change in direction and what we want more than anything else is for our character to rep represent him, tell the truth about him, everything we do, everything we are, and we trust him through faith to do that for us if we allow him to, if we make the choice to let him do that. And so this morning, this morning as we contemplate what Jesus said here, the thing we need to do is make sure that we don't get in the way of him doing what he wants to do. Let's just close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much for your promise that you will give us a new heart, that you will take out our, our heart of flesh, the stony heart of flesh, and you will give us a new heart. This morning we ask for that new heart. We invite you into our lives, and we just ask you to make us like you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.